Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. When God decides to bless you with some increased riches, He's now testing you. So what you're going to do now is you're going to say, Lord, I know you gave me the ability to get this, whether through relatives, connections, bonuses, hard work, the strength to work hard, smart hard, whatever, I got this. But now, Lord, now you're going to test me. What am I going to do with this? Am I going to be willing to say, I'm content, I rejoice, but I'm content what I have. This is more than what I actually needed. So I am now dedicating it to you. Now, dedicating that to the Lord could come in many different facets. It doesn't mean you have to, as soon as you get it, give it all away. But it does mean as soon as you get it, don't own it. That's the point. The second is, you need to see the needs of others. Often when God gives you things, it is to help to advance His kingdom. It's made up of the needs of other people that need to see an eternal perspective. All right, so then what happens after you're tested? Number three, poverty can come in. And now poverty is also relative. Poverty means I have one penny less today than I had yesterday. So there's a degree of poverty. Now notice this. If God can also give you the power to get wealth, look in Job 121. At least this is a principle for Job, but I think it works for us today. It says the Lord gave and the Lord what? Has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So it implies that God will take it away. Now when he takes it away, that means God is sovereign. He is in control of everything we can't control, including our resources. Now, what would be some reasons or why he would take it away? Let me give you three. Number one, unwise choices. Sometimes God gives us this. He gave us the ability to get it. But we are in poverty because we made wrong choices. We decided not to work to get more. We decided to live off what we had. We bought things that were uh, with, without a good uh, re, um, research on it. So we got a, a poor product when he bought it. So any way we do it, we spend it on consumable stuff that's gone. You know, we supersize all of our soda all the time. And now we wonder why we don't have any money. Families are financially stressed right now. They're so fi financially stressed. It could be that they had plenty of money, but they spent it at all the Burger Kings. And so the Burger King managers and owners owners are driving your Mercedes, if you know what I'm trying to say. So it's unwise choices. Third is sacrificial giving. Some had a lot of money, but they were led of God. Not everybody's doing this, but some are, are led to give it away. I'm thinking of a man who happened to be England's greatest cricket player back in the 1800s. He was famous. He gets saved and he says, you know what? There are starving lost people in Africa and I not just want to give them money. What I want is I want to reach them. So he says, I'm going to surrender myself to the Lord to become a missionary to those who are in Africa. In those days, they went to Africa. Today, you can go to Japan, China. You can go back to America. You can go anywhere in the world. But the purpose is to reach him. He then chose to give away all of his money. Now, here was his reason. He said if he didn't give it away, it was because the money and what he had was too great of a temptation for him. And it became a weight for him. So he said, if I can give that away... It then will leave me in a position, here it is, where I have to now depend upon God and not my ability to get more money through my athletic ability or the money that I have through an inheritance from a very wealthy father. I now have to totally abandon myself to God because I knew that when I'm alone with God, that built my relationship. Now, I'm not giving you that principle that everybody should do that. The concept, though, is whatever it is, you have abandoned yourself to the Lord with a lot or with a little. And so poverty can come. So sacrificial giving. And here's a third way that poverty can come. And we're going to call that just an act of God. This is way beyond you. You, ha you had nothing to do with this. You're living holy before God. You're doing what you can. God gives you something. But something happens that you could not control. He takes away the money. He takes away the resources. He burns your house down, steals your car. Kids, your, your iPod is gone. Someone smashed and dropped your, your cell phone and your parents can't replace that again. Mom and dad, they downsized on your job. You lost your job. The economy goes south. You that are in sales, you can't make up for it. You've done everything you can. You've lived righteous. You worked hard. You were honest. You, were, you had integrity. But God said, I'm now going to test you through some poverty. What will you do? Look go back to the verse. Lord gave, the Lord take away. But the last part of that is the key. What did he say? Everybody say it with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A lot of times what we want to do is read it this way. We want to read it this way. The Lord gave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> Are y'all with me on that? Maybe it ought to be, hey, the Lord took it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, you know. And by the way, sometimes if he does take it away, it might be blessed. Number four, then, what comes? 
which I think is really the root of it all. It's a full cycle thing. So we get the riches, we're tested, we have poverty, now we develop faith. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And the answer is yes. It's not rich in money, it's rich in faith. Now I'm not talking about the name and claim it kind of junk, that prosperity gospel. Lord, you gave me more faith so I could trust you to give me more money. No, it's Lord, you gave me more faith so I can rejoice and be content with having less. That's the direction God wants us to go. Then when he bountifully gives all this stuff to us, then we don't become its slave. We become a manager of it for his glory. So what should we do? We should set our affections on God, not on things on the earth. We should develop our prayer life. So it's, remember, prayer is not asking God so much as it is developing an intimate relationship with him through communicating with him. So what are three kind of circumstances that could come into my life now? Those are things I can control and I do. Well, it's still about contentment. There are things that are going to come into my life I can control, and I do. If there's a television program that comes on and you shouldn't watch it, shut it off. You can, you can change. You can make choices what we're saying. So there are things you can control and do. Number two, there are things that I can control and I don't. And we would call that laziness. If you can change a situation to make it better for you, then do it. Now, where do I get that in the Bible? The Bible says God gave me power to get wealth, so he gave me the ability to make changes, and so there, therefore I should. So there are times that we can control it, but we don't. We sit around, we have a soda, a Coke, coffee, talk around, talk story all the time, but we never move ahead. Seeking great things isn't in itself wrong. When you seek it for your own grandeur, it's for your own fluffing of your own life bed, then it becomes a selfish, greedy ambition. And that's where the danger is. So if you can control it, do it. Then there are those who can control it and they don't and they have problems. And then there are number three, there are things in life that you can't control. There's going to be a lot of those things that you really can't control and life is going to throw you a real curveball. Those are uncontrollable circumstances in our life and that's where we need to have contentment. And I always like to say that there are circumstances in our life that we have to adapt to and sometimes they're also people that we have to adapt to also. That's why it says that we should be, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. So let's give deep lesson number two. Contentment comes from learning to adapt to circumstances and people, or change. Circumstances change, people change. Many years ago, I had a young man who I led to the Lord, who God has blessed intellectually, educationally, academically. God has opened up doors. He was a Hispanic from Mexico that was in San Antonio. And I remember meeting him in a tiny little, little no pictures on the wall, dirty office, big old stogie in his mouth, fresh out of law school. And he says, tell me about this Jesus guy you always talk about. So I told him all about how God loved him. Jesus died, rose again by faith alone. He could have everlasting life. We had a lot of talk story times. Finally, he came to faith. Then we started discipling him. He then got a hunger for the word, decided to make, uh, he wanted to be a person of law and grace, he called it. I want, to be, I want to know the law, the best that law can be known by a man. And he says, but I also want to know grace, the best that a man can know grace. I want to be a man of law and grace. God began to use him, open up doors. He was used then in ministry with his wisdom for legal issues as well as just wise counsel because he was a man of the book. They then saw him. He was hired at Pepperdine University as the number one professor in universal law. Found a, a man that himself was a, a very extremely wealthy um, Mexican, Hispanic had his own Learjet, would fly him from Los Angeles, forget the name of the airport, it's not LAX, it's the one up, up the road, Burbank, I think, somewhere up there, and he would fly then into Mexico on a private jet just to have consultation and fly back that afternoon to teach his classes. Isn't that incredible? This man taught me a lot about living a separated life for the Lord, knowing how you can succeed in the world of law and still not have to compromise. He was a man that had a personality like the majority of you, that changed to one a sweet, soft, tender, humble spirit, and he just let truth be his voice, the loudness of it. And here's the one truth he gave. Gave me many, but here's one that fits this. He says, Stan, he says, I have learned as a law professor dealing with all sorts of conflict, and by the way, Pepperdine has a whole institution on mediation and it trains a lot. And he said, there's one thing that I've learned. There's only one thing in life that seems to be constant. And I'm listening. What is that? What is that one thing that's constant? He said, change. You think about that. There's always going to be things changing. And we need to learn to adopt, adapt to it. Now, number three, 
because we're having to learn to, to you know, avoid comparisons, adapt to change. The question now is, how do I do this? Number three is our answer. Learn to draw on Christ's power. The verse then says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Years ago when I was in Bible college, people were getting their names with the gold on their Bibles. How many of you have your name gold on your Bible? Anybody do that? Okay. Then they got real, they thought, I'm going to put my life verse down there. And they put their life verse. Some had Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Others had John 3, 16. A lot of people had this verse here, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, it is true you can do all things. Now, that doesn't mean you can uh, uh, fly, you know. It doesn't mean you can bound over buildings like Superman, but it does mean you can do all things. Now, you can take that and say, I can do all godly things through Christ. But if you want to be a good student of the word, that passage is written in the context of, I can do all things for contentment through Christ. I can be content in this world. I don't have to have what other people have. I don't have to have more. I don't have to have people like me. I can have a handle on my greed and my ungodly ambition, and I can be content. That's what I can do in Christ. So those of you that are saying, Stan, you gave a lot of great principles, but I don't know that I can live that way. And here's my frank answer to you folks. You can't. I can't. We can't. But he can through us. And that's why we depend upon his power to do that. We can't be this content without his help to get through this. Look at how the Amplified Version says it. He says this, I am ready for anything, and I'm equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me that I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Woo! That's powerful stuff right there. So he says, I can handle being wealthy. So some of you that are worried about having money and all this stuff that goes with it, don't worry about it. God will help you with all that. You can do it. You can deal with it with a separated integrity way. You can handle it to the glory of God and do it humbly and use it for the building of his kingdom, for his glory. You can do it. You can do it. God will give you the power. Some of you say, boy, if I lost this and I didn't have that, what would I do when the market crashes, when, when my house doesn't sell and all that? You can make it. You can make it as long as you're in Christ. Your strength comes from him. Look at your deep lesson. Problems come into my life so I can learn contentment through prayer. Now, again, it's not just asking him to get you out of the problem. It's building a relationship that he is there with you through all of these. <clears throat> and now number four. Learn to depend on God to meet your needs. This verse says this, And my God shall supply all your need, not all your greed, but all your need, according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus, can supply all my need, whatever I need. So if you need the ability to handle wealth, God will give you that. He'll meet you with that need. He'll take care of that need for the wisdom, for the proper investment and expenditures and usage of that. If you go through a time that you don't have, if you really need it, God will provide it. If he hasn't provided it, you've cleaned your life, you've put everything in order, your heart is clean before him. Your relationship is intimate, and you don't have it yet. It's not that God failed or his word failed. It's that you don't need it. When you need it, you will get it. And now, how do I know that? Watch this now. I don't know who your God is, and I think I have a biblical view of God, but I don't see God up in heaven as being stingy, cheap, selfish. I see a God in heaven who is, yea, a benevolent father, who himself at a core value is that he is a giver because he gave his son on the cross for me who doesn't even deserve eternal life nor his son. So he's a giver. So if he doesn't give me at that point, I don't need it yet. So now I can have contentment. I can do what Paul did, rejoice greatly because God is at the very center of my life. The people that have a problem with contentment are the people that really have a problem with God. That's pretty heavy duty, I know. But if you look at that, that's it. I, I, can I give you my opinion? If, I would, if you were to ask me, what are the three main sins or, 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 or roots of, of problems that people have, in my opinion now, other than unbelief, which is kind of, I think, the root of all of that, I think it's going to be moral impurity, believing that they have to have that lifestyle because they don't, they're not satisfied with the love 
of God and the sufficiency of God. Number two, I think it's going to be bitterness because they need to have people do things for them and they don't feel like life is fair because they don't have a confidence in the sovereignty of God. Watch this. And number three, I think it revolves somewhere with greed. Moral impurity, bitterness, and greed. And I think if I talk to people that are struggling, I think a lot of their problems, if I'm going to try to find out what might be their root problem, not their surface problem, but their root problem, I think I could get it back to moral impurity, bitterness, greed. Now, see how my fingers kind of go to the center of the palm of my hand? At the very center of this problem, the root of that, the root of those roots is going to be unbelief. And remember, it's not belief in myself. You have a lot of cyber, 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 cyber psychonetics or whatever it's called. Watch this now. It's the belief in a sovereign God who loves you and me so much. And he says, I love you. You are a king's kid. You are a son, a child of God. I am your father. My reputation is on how I will take care of you. So don't chase after a world system. That's going to only get you messed up. Let me take care of you. Be content in me. Believe it and be satisfied. So the things you can control, control. The things you should control, control. The things you can't control, rest in God. He's going to be there for you. Here's your deep lesson number four. God meets all my genuine needs. God meets all my genuine needs. Well, folks, I want to bring this to a close now. If you'll notice, we began with, he rejoiced greatly in the Lord. I want to bring it to a close that our contentment comes from God. And so what would be, first of all, our greatest need? Our greatest need is going to be our sins forgiven, a wonderful home in heaven. That's kind of a byproduct. It's not like you get this, so you get a home in heaven. That the home in heaven is kind of like a byproduct of the results of you trusting Christ. When you trust Christ, here's what happens. You have an intimate relationship with Almighty God who is your Father. And because of that, He provides for you in this life, and then He'll provide for you in the next life, which is your home in heaven. But the reason He can do that is because He has given you eternal life, His Son. He that has the Son has everlasting life. And you need the Son. You don't need it by being good or joining a church. You can't pay your way to get the Son in your life, S-O-N. You have to say, Lord, I am bankrupt. I messed up my life. In fact, I've learned that i got a lot of sin issues out there, but I know why they're there. It's because my heart's not right. And I need to have a new heart. And I know to get that new heart, it's got to start with that juncture of faith. And I'm going to now place not my faith in myself, not my faith in my good deeds, or my faith in a belief system. I'm going to place my faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, who loved me, a giving God who wants to provide for my deepest need, which are sins forgiven, a home in heaven, a relationship with Him. So here's what you say to the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I messed it all up, but I know why I messed it all up, because I don't have the power to do anything else but mess up. And some days are better days than others, but when it's all done, it's not he who, win, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's he who dies is dead. And you're in hell. And he says, I want to go to heaven. So would you simply say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you. I believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And without any good works, but by faith alone, I'm trusting in you to be the forgiver of my sins. And I want to thank you for accepting me into your everlasting family. It's not so much that God comes into my life as much as I come into his life. I get his life. It's an exchange life when I trust him as my savior. And boy, do I have a good, benevolent father who says, I'm going to give you just what you need. Then I'm going to test you. Then you're going to have some poverty to see that I'll be there to take care of you. And then I'm going to strengthen your faith because the stronger your faith, the more intimate relationship you have with me. Let's pray, shall we? My friend, I really love you and all of us need to work on this. I don't want you to think any preacher is beyond all of this. We all struggle. We live in the same world, go to the same malls and have the same newspapers delivered to us. We run in some of the same crowds and we have some of the same needs. But I want to tell you unequivocally that 
God is a God who will take care of you and you can be content in Him. So the first thing you want to do is to come to Him just as you are and say, Lord, I want you first and foremost. I believe that you are the Lord who died on the cross as Jesus Christ and rose again. And now I'm placing my faith in you. Now you can't make a mistake. God knows your thoughts. He's that kind of a good God. As long as it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, you'll have everlasting life. So is it a prayer? Hmm, it could be. But it's more a mental transaction where you are fully and confidently trusting in Christ alone. Now you can do it by telling him that, or you can just do it in your minds. The point of the matter is, is that it's by faith in him. Now, I'd like to pray for you. So here's what you might do. You might say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe that you are the Lord who died for me, and I'm trusting in you to forgive me of my sin. Now, however you do that in your own words, just do it. You can be content in a God then who will never cast you out. He will never lose you. You will forever be his child, and he promises to take care of you so you can be content. With whatever you don't have, it's okay because you don't need it. Because if you need it, he'll give it to you. If you ask a bread, he's not going to give you a rock. He's going to give you what you need. He's your dad. He's your heavenly father. And by the way, I'll tell you, you may really need it. And you don't have it yet. It's because you don't need it yet. You still need it. And God will get it to you in his timing. Today. You're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior by faith. Now, me praying for you won't save you. Raising your hand won't save you. But you trusting Christ does. Is there anyone in here today that's trusting Christ as your Savior today? Christians, how about you? Are you ready to learn to be content? How many of you would like to have prayer because you want to learn to avoid comparisons? What other have? Those of you who are single can say, I'm so lonely. I wish I had a mate. I wish I had a mate like so-and-so has one. Why did they get one? They live such a weird life, and <laughs> I'm trying to live so right, and I'm so alone. You'll never have a better mate than the Lord. And at the right time, God will bring you the right one when that right one becomes the right one for you. How many of you would like to have prayer because you need, you need to adapt to change more? You need to be flexible when you have it and when you don't. And you've been kind of just trying to keep everything all balanced, all the books all balanced, and you have a standard that you've set up. And you need to have prayer that you're just going to say, Lord, when I have it, I praise you. When I don't have it, it's okay. I'm learning how to have a lot, and I'm learning how to have a little. But it doesn't really matter because I'm learning about you. And you'd like for me to pray for you. How many of you are saying, I've tried to solve all this contentment stuff on my own and I need to draw on God's power and I'm going to depend upon the Lord to meet my needs. And so, Pastor, would you pray for me as I'm learning to be content and I'm learning how to teach contentment, at least the principles of it, to my cakey, my kids. God bless you. God bless you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this wonderful church, these wonderful people. And we're all learning this. First of all, we want to say thank you for being our Heavenly Father, for providing for us and taking care of our needs. Then we want to confess the times that you've given us resources. Then we went ahead and we misused those. So now we've got more than what we really need, and they're breaking down, and we need more money to service these things and pay for them to get repaired and protected and stored and everything else, Lord. And now, Lord, we, we, we want to learn contentment. We want to celebrate what you've given to us. We want to use it for the glory of God. We want to offload what we don't need. We want to keep what we need. But whatever we have, Father, we want to honor you with it. And Lord, I thank you as pastor that I don't have to spell it out what's what with anybody in here, that this is something that you do personally with them. And whatever they work out is fine with me, Lord, as long as they're doing it with you. Help us to be a church as well, the same thing, that we don't compare ourselves to big churches, fancy churches that have a lot of stuff that we don't have, that we get plunged into debt to get. And Father, that we would plunge ourselves to our knees and seek you and let you provide. And yet, Father, help us not to be a church that's apathetic or lazy or selfish with our money that we don't give so that we could have more and better. So Father, yea, grant us wisdom and discernment in all of this. For Father, we want to be a church 
upon whom you will smile as we grow in grace in the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.